using WordPress plugin boilerplate, and I'm going to go over the 3.0 version that came out in October, just in case you're aware of the project and have looked at previous versions. Um, first, a little about me. I develop under the name Slushman, so if you ever see any things in the forums or plugins by Slushman, <coughs> it's most likely me or some imposter. Um, I started using WordPress back in 2007, uh, actually with WordPress.com. Moved to a self hosted WordPress in 2008 and actually wrote an ebook for musicians to build their own websites using uh, WordPress and a bunch of plugins that I had found. And actually started developing stuff for WordPress back in 2011. I currently have three plugins on the repo uh, Artist Data Press, which is for musicians, uh, BuddyPress Profile Widgets, and the Buddy Bar Widget. Welcome to check those out. And I'm in the middle of rewriting them all to use this structure, so we'll go over how all of that looks. Um, about six months ago, my family and I moved to Decatur, Illinois from Nashville. And I'm the lead web developer at DCC Marketing. It's a uh, full-service boutique marketing agency based in Decatur. We have an office also in Chicago. And these are the crazy people that I work with. <laughs> this is our Halloween photo, and if you'll notice the goober up in the top middle, labeled web developer, that's the guy who shopped for a costume the night before and then got up and forgot it was Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So let's go ahead and jump in here. Um, real quick, before I really get started, I'd love to say thank you. Um, how many, like, does anybody have any published plugins on the plugin directory? Awesome. A few people, a bunch of people like me who have stuff that's not published. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Anybody learning? Like one of the, okay, yeah, I mean we're all learning, so we have long walks on the beach and pina coladas. Anybody like that? <laughs> Double yeah, joke, I should have been here. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so WordPress, WordPress plugin boilerplate is a mouthful. Uh, just a brief history, it was originally written by Tom McFarland of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he published it in 2011. Uh, he said the reason he put it together was because he kept writing a lot of the same stuff for every plugin and he got tired of having to set it all up from scratch every single time. So he put together just this real simple boilerplate to start all of his plugins. Uh, it's now up to the 3.0 version as of October last year. But as of March 4th this month, he's handed that off to Devin Vinson of Tampa Bay, Florida. So Devin will be heading things up and moving things forward. I think it sounded like they both had the same vision for where it should go. So Devin's the new guy. I know Tom has been working on a lot of documentation and stuff and just hasn't been swamped and hasn't had a chance to do it. So Devin's helping out with a lot of that. Now when I was putting this together and they said this is what we want you to talk about, my first question for me and <coughs> why would you use this? Because there's lots of these things, but this is a particular one. So. And really, this applies to any of most of the plugin boilerplates that you're going to find out there on like GitHub or whatever. First of all, it helps keep things organized. Um, when you're doing plugin development, and I'll say this firsthand just from my experience, really good to keep things organized, especially when you've got to come back to it in eight months and go, what was I doing? At least keeping a consistent structure and keeping things organized helps you when you come back and you have to maintain that thing. Um, Second of all, it uses the WordPress coding standards, and for those who don't know, there are coding standards. Just the way you format things, and they are very consistent about doing that. And the same for the documentation standards. Um, just had a whole thing about documentation, and they're really good about keeping this documented. All the PHP docs are there, and they're working on the uh, website for the additional documentation. Uh, it uses the standard WordPress API, so they're not just doing their own thing. Everything that you will see that I'm going to show you is all standard WordPress stuff that you will see that eventually, that at least eventually, gets stacked into WordPress APIs and is not doing its own crazy thing. And it's all translatable out of the box, which is a great practice to get into if you're not doing that. Um, WordPress is rapidly expanding in the international world, and this is out of the box translatable for everything. So, what's new in the 3.0? Um, for starters, he completely rewrote everything. He took a lot of feedback from several developers and uh, rewrote everything. Now, some of the structure is similar to what he had in the 2.0, um, and some of that carried over, but there's a lot of questions that people had, like, where do I put this, and how do I integrate that? So he put in ways to actually, uh, you know, organization to actually help you uh, 
uh, integrate certain things that need to be shared between like the public stuff and the admin stuff. It's all built in now. Um, for those who even know what this is, there is no more singleton. If that's a thing for you, great. If it's not, you have no idea what that means. Don't worry about it. It's a hotly debated topic. Personally, I'm glad the singleton's gone. Um, like I said, there is a new structure. And we have now have a website for it. Uh, you can go here and you can get direct links to the GitHub. And eventually, there will be documentation, code samples, the whole nine yards. It'll all be there. So let's take a look at the structure real quick. Um, <clears throat> Now for those who have stuff published, you've probably seen something very similar to this, especially with trunk and assets. <coughs> That's stuff that the plugin directory needs. Uh, SPN, very common things for that. Uh, assets is where your screenshots and your logos and all that kind of stuff for a plugin directory would go. And then uh, trunk is where the vast majority of your plugin is going to live. That's all the working files. Um, so inside there, you'll notice there's admin and public. They are structured exactly the same way. Uh, both have a CSS folder, a JavaScript folder, and a partials folder. We'll get into a little more detail on each one of those later. Um, but they are basically structured the same way. They each have a class as well. Um, then there's the includes folder. And this is one of the big things that's new about the 3.0. This is one of the things that people were asking, like, I've got this thing, and I need it to be both in admin and in public. What do I do with it? And in 2.0, there really wasn't a good option. People were kind of making up all kinds of stuff. So they made the includes folder. And you can see there's a lot of stuff in there that's very different from the 2.0 version. We're going to go through all that in detail here in a second. But before we get to that, let me give you a piece of advice. Use a generator. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you're going to have to go through and rename you know, when you pull the GitHub uh, repo for this to set up a new plugin. And this website, this generator, actually makes it super easy. You can type all in, type in all of your like uh, text domain for internationalization, the name of the plugin, your authorship information, and it just generates it all for you. You don't have typos and all the craziness that comes from search and find and replace. And I know I've done plenty of that and made a big mess. So uh, we'll start at the top. First thing that WordPress is going to see is plugin name.php. Now, if you're using the generator, this is going to be your plugin.php. And obviously, at the top, like any WordPress plugin, you've got the typical documentation comments. He's also using the PHP doc versions of, of those same properties if they exist. Um, then, underneath that, you've got the register, register activation hook and the register deactivation hooks. Um, now I'm going to show you these classes that it refers to, the uh, activator and deactivator, because they're empty. There's nothing in there. So if you need to use those, they're there. They're all set up, and they're all hooked in and ready to go. But they're empty, and I kind of a boring slide. So I'm not going to show you that. Uh, but you can see, again, we're using the standard WordPress API stuff, register activation hook, register deactivation hook. And then down at the bottom, we uh, instantiate, or we include our class, our plugin class. And then we call the run method within there to actually get things off. So that brings us to the plugin class. Now at the top, you've got the constructor. And again, for those who are familiar with object-oriented programming, this is really common stuff. Um, we've got the internationalization string and the version, which is used for cache busting later. And then we call a bunch of methods right here, and we're going to go through those. So first up is load dependencies. And this uh, actually calls all, most of the files in includes, as well as the main plugin class, uh, the classes within admin and public. And again, that just ties it all together and helps it, uh, makes it go. Um, and then we also instantiate a, um, an instance of the loader class, which we'll go over in detail in a minute. Underneath that, we set the uh, internationalization string and register that with WordPress. <coughs> And then, this is one of the interesting things. Um, this is the define admin hooks um, method. And if you aren't used, to, well, if you are used to seeing WordPress and doing things like the add action and add filters that we talked about earlier today, you'll notice uh, we're doing something very similar. We're calling this loader add action. I didn't, I didn't put the public hooks, but it's structured exactly the same way. So I, again, I don't want to duplicate stuff, so try to keep it easy. But you notice we call up uh, plugin admin there. And then we tell it, we're going to refer this stuff to add action. 
And it works exactly the same way as the WordPress ad action. And you'll see later we're actually calling WordPress's ad action. But this is a neat little structure in how they built all of this. It, all of your hooks are within basically these two methods within your plugin class. Keeps it really neat and organized, and again, it's all about organization. Um, so if we look at the loader class, and this is, that add action is actually in the loader class here. Um, so obviously we're setting up two blank arrays, actions and filters. And then the add action method within this class is the same as add filter. And you can see, it, Basically, we're, we're adding all this stuff that was passed into add action to the actions array, which then goes down to the run method, which is just basically a loop and saying add action, whatever's in that, that array. And again, add filters works exactly the same way. Again, I'm not showing it because it's duplicate, so, but it's the exact same stuff. <clears throat> so that brings us to the admin and public classes. Obviously, the constructor, we're just bringing in the plugin name for internationalization and the version for cache busting. Really, the public and admin classes are blank, but he did put in these two um, example scripts and styles so you can see how this all works together because you can look at the plugin class and see, okay, he's doing add action here and that refers to this thing over here. This is one of those examples. On Q styles, this is on the front end. Uh, no, sorry, on the back end. This is uh, from leave from the admin. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Front end, my bad. Uh, we're on queue style, and you can see it's all the typical stuff. If you've ever done an on queue style, there it is. There's nothing different about it from the WordPress normal way of doing it. It's going to be fairly similar to what you're used to, and the same thing for scripts. If you've done this before, there it is. Really, the biggest difference between what you would do in just a straight file or just a whatever plugin name.php and using this is the loader class where you're doing you know, this loader add action, this loader add fil filter in your plugin class, plus the instructor to help you organize. Now, there's obviously other files included. Um, we've got index.php, keeps people from browsing your directories. Uh, a languages folder, again, set up for internationalization. That POT file is there, but it's blank. It's up to you to fill it in once you're done. Because obviously, if there's nothing there, you can't fill it in. Um, copy of the GPL2 license. And we have a readme text, which is set up for the plugin directory. Again, that's all that plugin directory info. When you hit that page, it's all coming from this readme file. And then an uninstall.php, which is used for when you actually uninstall and delete the plugin if you need to do anything. For example, removing plugin settings in the, in the database. So, now, am I going too fast? I don't want to blaze through too much and have people be like, what? Wait, okay? Okay. Um, so that leads me to now what? Because obviously that's it. That's all the, that, that's literally it. That's what the plugin boilerplate is. You download it, that's what you're going to see. So what I did is I put together a few examples. And we've already seen on queue styles and scripts. Again, if you're used to doing that, it's really, really simple. I think you'll figure it out when you download it and see how things are structured. But I also put together a custom post type, a taxonomy, some very simple plugin settings, meta boxes, short code, I went crazy. I'm going to talk about the displays and views and what all that means. That's the partials folder. Uh, and then widgets. And I actually found a couple of different ways to do the widgets. So let's in here. Uh, custom post type and define admin hooks. And again, this is specific to admin hooks. You're not going to do this in the public. You see this loader add action. We're going to hook it on init. We're going to send it to the admin class. And then I call my function new CPT jobs. I put together this very uh, really simplistic plugin for a client called now hiring. It's just contains this custom post type. And I've expanded on that. And that's the sample code that we're looking at here. So I call mine uh, new CPT jobs. And then in the admin class, there's my method. Now, this is very abbreviated, and I know I write my arrays weird, and I'm sorry for those who are kind of discombobulated, but this is a very, very brief version of it. You're not seeing all of it. This is the dot, dot, dot. But you can see down at the bottom, register post type, and there it is. So you got all the options. If you're used to writing a custom post type, it's standard stuff. You've seen this before. It's really about that, that loader class and how you hook into the add actions and add filters. That makes and the same basic thing applies to the taxonomy. To find admin hooks, we send it new tax type. 
And then there's our new taxonomy type. Register taxonomy. Is that clear for everybody? And again, I don't want to go too fast or confuse anyone. So, um, and this is all straight out of the codex. If you, you know, if you need better examples, they've got them all. And again, you can download this plugin and, and see all of those options in its entirety on, in the actual plugin. Uh, plugin settings require a little bit more. Uh, we're sitting in the add menu and then register settings. So obviously, register settings, we register the setting, we put together a section, and then we, I just put in one field. You can do more than one field. When we do the options page, we get standard stuff. We're not using anything crazy here. Um, we add the menu, which references all the same stuff within that same class. You notice we're sending array this options page. And then we display the section, we display the field, and we validate. Now, this is something I like to put in a lot of my plugins is these settings links here. Um, these guys, as well as you can also put things links at the end of the thing here. I put in a cap, empty cap, got a reference or somewhere. Um, so you can add those in. I did it, a quick example of those as well. Um, now this is one place where you're going to get into trouble because a lot of plugins you'll see when they when they go to register the settings over there, you have to tell it which specific setting they're trying to get to. Okay. Um, but a lot of people will use plugin base name in the add action, and you can't do that because you're buried into a class. And I was actually looking at WordPress SEO, and this is how they do it, which I'm like, all right, these guys are shocked. I'm going to follow their lead. You set up a constant, and I call my now, now hiring base name. You don't have to do the constant, but this is one way of doing it. And you're going to end up using that over here. Plugin action links, now hiring base name. Now, I could just skip all that and say now hiring action links underscore now dash hiring, and it'll do the same thing. But we can reuse that base name later for nonsense, uh, verifying nonsense, as well as this. Um, so you can see we set it up to add actions. We go through a couple of those methods real quick. If you've done these settings links before, again, it's pretty simple stuff. You're just grabbing all the links, adding in your own, and returning it. And the same thing for the row links. <coughs> So, and this is another place where we're using that constant, now hiring base name. So we're making sure we're looking at the right plugin so that we can put it in the right spot. Meta boxes, uh, define admin hooks. We've got a couple here. Uh, save your meta and add meta boxes. <clears throat> so obviously we're adding the meta box, and I like to put all of them in one thing. Um, so if you have more than one meta box, you can register them all in one place. And then we actually do this. Now, we're, we're going to go over this in a little more detail, but you notice this is the actual meta box. This is supposed to show you the code for the meta box, and we're not. We're including a path, and that's the partials folder that's in admin and um, public. And again, we'll go over that in just a little bit more detail in a second. And then obviously, save meta. I removed most of the code because it actually went way off the screen. So. If you've ever saved meta, you know what this does. Basically, we're just doing some real simple stuff to say, are we sure we're in the right place? And let's save it and update it. Is the reason why you're doing this on save meta and not save post? What's that? Is the reason why you're doing it on save meta and not on save post? Uh, the function is called save meta. It's actually hooked to save post. Oh, OK. So I can go back and uh, You're good. <laughs> yeah, save post jobs there. Yeah. So yeah, we're at, yeah. yeah you're good. And again, I'm using this specific custom post type here, so it's not just save any post. So I don't have to test to say, are we sure we're in the jobs post? I'm actually referring to the jobs custom post type. So good question. <coughs> so yeah, that's the same meta. If you've ever done this before, you've seen it. Um, so now short codes. This is the first one that we've seen here for the public class. But again, it works all the same way. So we're still hooking into init. But we're going to send it to register short codes. And we're going to refer to the public class there. So register short codes. You can register as many as you want. I, I, again, I like to do them all in one thing. Nine times out of 10, I don't have more than one, but there you go. If you need more than one, you can register them all here. And just briefly, some short code method code here. Um, and again, since we're calling from a custom post site, I actually sent that out to another function to actually get uh, to do the WP query. 
Uh, so that's called get job post there right in the middle. And then you'll notice there's a www or the uh, dot 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 there. That's actually where we're going to call one of our partials. Um, now for those who, uh, do we have any MVC strict guys? Anybody doing that? Any idea what I just said? Okay, <laughs> okay good. All right, uh, in the MVC world, they call these things views. Um, but in this case, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm just saying that middle section in there for the, for the uh, short code is just saying, if we're looking at the right stuff, if we're getting the result that I want, we're going to include this folder or this uh, file here. And what that file actually does um, is it calls another file. And in that file, I'm doing a loop. And so basically, we're looping through all the results that we just got back from our custom post type. And I'm saying now we're going to include a single display of that, that post. Um, and in that single display, we come back, wow, I didn't know I had that second slide in there, sorry. Um, and then this is what's actually in the partials. This is, you basically keep the, all your HTML separated from the logic. NBC guys are really going to be used to that. So here it is. There's a little bit of PHP built in there. Um, the big advantage that I think of doing it this particular way, and you know, like I said, with the loop and then having a separate thing is, and this is why I have this in here. Um, if you wanted to, you could have a plugin option that determines which layout is actually going to be displayed. So you could say, all right, we're going to have a layout option. And I don't know if we want single cal I cal view, do we want the single whatever view, I mean, you, you can have a hundred different layouts and you can switch for them all from one statement just based on the plugin option. And then uh, you keep them all separated out into separate files, so you just call them the right one when it's based on the user's preferences. So I've worked a lot with widgets, that's how I got started with uh, WordPress programming. And my big question was, where the heck do you put widgets? Obviously you can put them in includes, but you know, they're public and they're admin, they're mixed all within the same class, so what do you do? I found two different ways to do it. I'm not going to say which one's right or which one's wrong because they both work, so it's kind of up to you. But uh, option one, uh, in both cases, you're going to need uh, in your plugin class, you're going to load up the dependency, which is the actual widget file. You're also going to have a function a method within your uh, plugin class called init widgets, where you're just telling WordPress, hey, I have a widget. And then you're also going to, we're going to use a thing called flush widget cache. Uh, and again, we're checking it against our jobs custom post type there. So method one, we're going to use, uh, we're going to keep everything within the plugin class itself. So we're in the includes folder, we're using the plugin class. So up in the constructor, constructor we're going to add a method called to define widget hooks. And define widget hooks is structured exactly the same way as admin hooks and then public hooks. And we're just loading in all this stuff. Now, most of this is for the cache trusting. Um, so if you're saving a post, if you're deleting a post, or switching the theme, we're going to clear out the cache. It's the flush widget cache method I just showed a second ago. Uh, but other than that, we're just calling widgets in it on widgets in it. Um, and like I said, that works just fine. The other method is actually to create a shared class. And it works. It's going to be structured exactly the same way as the admin and public class. I actually put in folders as well for CSS and JavaScript and, and the partials. Um, kind of do it however you want. There's, there's no right answer. This is just one way that I figured it out. So uh, in this case, we're going to say define shared hooks. And I did that right? Okay, yeah. And load dependencies, we're going to load in the, the shared uh, class, which is in a separate file now. We're going to define the widget hooks in the shared class. And that's pretty much all that's in the shared class. And again, that works just as well as keeping it all in the plugin class. It's ultimately up to you. I don't know that there's any advantage to having a separate shared class versus keeping it all in the plugin class. So that's pretty much all I got for you. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast and a little nervous so I'm just going to blaze through it. Don't want to bore anybody at the same time. So, um, but I do want to post all these links and make sure you know where to go to get everything. Uh, the, the boilerplate website, boilerplate generator, my company, me, and my GitHub repo has the now hiring plugin on there. And there should be a post published right now on my website as well that gives you all those same links and how to get to it for reason. So, hope I didn't go too fast, but um, any questions? Yeah. <coughs>
Uh, my experience with plugins so far has been pretty basic. So my question for you is, um, with this plug-in boilerplate, mm -hmm. uh, which I've never used before, it, do you think that there is a lot of stuff that's built in that might be uh, bloated for somebody that's trying to create a simple plug-in, or do you think that there is some, like, that it's okay to just start using boilerplate even for simple plugins, mm -hmm. even if a lot of the stuff isn't being used? Mm -hmm. I, I was actually talking to Topher about that earlier. Um, I'm using it for everything. Even if I'm literally just creating, like the now hiring plugin literally started as just a custom post type, because that's all they needed. And I did it on boilerplate, mostly because everything that I'm creating is within boilerplate. So when I go to a, another plugin that I'm having to maintain, it's really helpful to have that same structure and know all right, what am I doing? Is this on the front end or the back end? And I know exactly where everything should be. I, there's no right answer. I mean, I, I personally would say yes. You know, just I would start there and learn the good practices that are already built in, especially with internationalization. Um, just, it's all out of the box, ready for you to use. So, so let's say you're not like, um, you know, creating custom post type for this in any particular plugin. Yeah. Um, the code that's in there for creating a custom post type. Uh, you know, does that get in the way? Is it just, or is that not even? No, none of that's none actually of that's included. In there. That was just like part all of those it. examples I showed you was stuff that I put together. That's okay. in my sample code. So okay. the, the the real thing it just has basically the activator, the loader, the internationalization. You got the admin side, the public side, and all it does is on key scripts in both. I uh, see. Like scripts and styles. I see. And so you start with a blank slate. Okay. And I know a lot of people, I've been watching that, that on GitHub, and a lot of people have been asking, like, well, how do I do a custom post type, or how do I do a, a short code? So I, I'm just showing you what can be done. I understand. Okay. And obviously, you can do a lot more complex things. I'm running into that rewriting my own plugins. So there's a lot more complex things you can do. Okay. But, yeah. What happens over time as the boilerplate is updated and maintained? Do you uh, sync back those base files, or just let it be? Older, slightly older versions, or is it pretty static? Uh, I mean, for a lot of ways it's static. Okay. They, they've done a few little updates here now. I know I contributed just a tiny bit to like the documentation. They did like one of the PHP doc thing calls wrong, and so I was like, here, you should be using it this way. Uh, but it hasn't changed a lot, and I think that's a good thing, just because they come up with a good structure, and it's pretty much blank, and there's not much to even change. So it's not like, oh, we found a bug, you know, uh, unless it's a WordPress bug, in which case that's not their problem. But I, I did find it kind of jarring to go from the 2.0 because it was a very different setup with the singleton and, and the different structure to go to the 3.0. It took me a while to figure it out, just like, what is happening here? But once I figured out that loader class and how it works with that action and how to structure everything, it was like, oh, this is, this is actually easier to me so, than the previous version. Can you take someone who doesn't know anything about Plugin builder, recommend that they learn the boilerplate first, or open up with a blank sheet, learn the rights and wrongs to how the, the codex says the right plugin for nothing, and then come to the boilerplate, you know, gay dies. That's a good question. I would, I would open that up to anybody. Does anybody have an opinion about that? I mean, it seems to me the best, I mean, it seems to me a more natural progression would be to write it without it. Because um, then you see then you see the need of it later. See, I feel like it would be better to start with the boilerplate and, and have that as your guide. Make sure you understand what the different things do, so that you're not. So when you're writing things, especially if you're starting from a blank slate, the biggest problem that you have is that you know you use a colon instead of a semicolon, or some stupid little syntax error that's going to screw you up, and you're going to stare at it for six hours before preparing all that other stuff. But if you have a solid base, why reinvent the wheel? As long as you understand, take that code, look at it, compare it to the codex, so that you understand what they're doing, but why reinvent the wheel when it's already been done for you? Well, I feel like, like as we, I, from what you saw, I thought I saw a lot of things. I'm like, well, you're not going to want that in every plugin, or right. not every plugin's going to have an admin portion, or not every plugin's going to have a front facing portion. And I've and done plenty like that. Yeah. You're yeah. going well, to want to know when you're going to want to remove things. And I don't know uh, if you're going to know if you start just simply with the boilerplate and pasting it onto every single plugin. 
that you'd be able to make those kinds of educated decisions. And how much time would you spend Googling and trying to figure out where the thing is that you might find when you could, like, again, if you have it there and you're just... We still have to know what program work was. It's just the structure of file, yeah, right? Basically, yeah. yeah. Because from what I understand, the boilerplate is like just a few, really just a few lines that, that call some other things. So if you don't need an admin side for it, it would be easy enough if you're looking at code and you want to say, okay, this is for the admin side, and comment that line out or take it out or whatever, and it's just, it's, it's not a thing anymore for your plugin. But if you look at it as a guide of what you need to learn from something that you know works rather than trial and error to get something to a functional point. I'm not saying every time I'm saying like Yeah, no, I know. But you, well, you said if you're starting from scratch, would it be better to start from scratch? I mean, like in high school, I had a calculus teacher that taught us the long way that required six sheets of paper to mm -hmm. answer every problem. And then he told us that the two buttons on our calculators that could get us the same answer. The point of it was to teach us how how it works. Once we know how it works, if we can use the two buttons, but we still know how it works. And that's what I'm getting at. If we find the functional thing that works and understand it, but still use it as your starting point. And I could, I mean, I could, yeah, I think we can all make a decent argument for either method. Like, I know I personally went from the single file thing and then had to learn to do object oriented programming. And it was very jarring. Like, where, where did this go? What am I doing? You know, even like the array this and then the name, you know, it's like, what is this? Why, why would you do that? And uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think you can make a really good argument. Yeah, I mean, in some ways it can seem like it overcomplicates things, especially if you're adding in the internationalization, but if you're really just doing it for yourself and it doesn't ever really need to be internationalized, like, it's like, then maybe that's, maybe that's too much. But again, if you know what those things are for, like, it can be overkill, but I don't know. Yeah. Like, I like to start from take out what I don't need. I was one of those kids that never wrote a draft. I always started from the finished product and took stuff out to turn into drafts. Well, like if you're, if you're creating a custom host type, it's pretty darn easy to go to the codex, grab the entire list yeah. with Ooh. all of the possible options, and then just take out the stuff you don't need. Exactly. That's what I'm typing in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do that by default just because. Even if it's the default value. Right. Well, I want to go there. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the, the custom post type thing before and just talking about the plugins that will generate that code for you. So you get the cute little graphic UI that's easier to do, and then you can yank that code out of there and drop it into the plugin boilerplate. You, know, you have easy methods to get to the same end. Yeah, I mean, like, I, one of my published plugins is just a widget. That's all it is. It takes stuff from BuddyPress and puts it in a widget, and that's it. So I'm like, I don't know, I mean, it might be radical overkill to use something like this. And at the same time, I'm publishing it. So I do need the internationalization. I need the README and all that stuff that's already built in. And it's already structured like what I'm already used to using anyway for SEN. So yeah, I mean, it may be overkill to have not just my one widget that's different from the rest of the plugin. I guess it all just depends on intended use. Yeah. Who's going to be using it? Is it going into the repository or is it just you and on the site? Yeah, right. Even Tom said this is overkill for really, really simple stuff. Right. I mean, I think it's really meant for stuff that you're going to publish as well as stuff that uh, you're going to have to maintain over the long term and it's a little more complex than just a customer. I'm starting to use it for everything just because. So. When I introduce <laughs> this to my students yeah. to write plugins, exactly. I yeah. start with absolutely nothing. They write simplest possible plug-in. Uh, if I were to present this to them right out of the gate, they would just turn yeah. it and run. There's so yeah. much there that you have to, to just rule out. Mm -hmm. So once they get the fundamental idea of what a plug-in is and how it's structured, then this tool I think would be a wonderful thing. But I was, yeah, I was I think that's what you were trying to say earlier too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Avoid the overwhelm at first. Yeah. But for those of us who do a lot, and you know what you're doing, and you've done plugins. I think this would be really helpful, especially if you keep it organized and structured. And start from a good base. So. Yeah. So to make an analogy, this sounds very much like this idea of the parent theme and the child theme. And so you have to kind of base code. That's why you start from the parent, and then you can add your modifications in the child. Yeah. Is that the right analogy? Yeah. I mean, the only difference would be this doesn't actually include anything. Like you, you know, you're still writing your own custom post type network. But you know, uh, that's not actually built in. So that's something I would like to see them maybe get to eventually is like an easy way for them to show. You want a custom post type, I need this this information from you. 
and then it's just it does it right. Almost like maybe the underscores like the underscores theme, where exactly. it has the shell, and you, you you still get to put in all the things that make it yours, but it gives you a good, a good starting point. Yeah, you're starting with no styling, and you got to do it all. Yeah, but yeah. So you mentioned they removed the single then. Did they replace it? The nearly anything reason behind that? I don't. I don't want to say. And, and to be honest, I, I jumped in like towards the end of 2.0 yeah. and was extremely confused by the concept of a single time. I spent about two months researching like, what is this? Why would you do that? And what does this mean? What are the dot dots? I don't know what's happening. You know? So it took me a while to wrap my head around it. But once I got it, it was like, okay, I, I guess I see. But I was used to, like, if you noticed in a lot of the code samples, they do like, you know, variable equals new class name. Yep. That's what I was used to seeing. So the singleton pattern was just like, what is happening? Like, so they're not doing it. It's a factory then? Yeah. Okay. Basically, yeah. This really allows you to not instantiate another instance. It's the idea is have yeah. one gotcha. main class. It just checks and sees if there's one already there. If it is, then it doesn't start again. Yeah. One of the objections to it is that it provides a global point of access to something. And global anything is always from. Yeah, and that's why I, I shuddered to, to actually show you the global uh, base name thing earlier because I'd read something. I was listening to a, a podcast on the way over here. I had a four hour drive. And uh, <laughs> they were talking about, like, oh, it's so terrible. You can't do PHP units on global, anything that uses a global. And I'm like, shoot, that's in my example book. You know? So, but like I said, I mean, I, I was working on one of the rewrites of my own plugins and I didn't have the base name. It's just that plugin links actually, or whatever it is. Uh, underscore and the name of the plugin, and it was working just fine. So you don't have to have it, but it's, it's more flexible. I did notice, like when you do save meta, there was a lot of references that I had in other plugins to that plugin base name file, and that's where the the, the base name constant came in. I was just able to drop that in and verify the nonce and everything. You know, plugin settings saved, the meta box is saved, everything worked nicely. But again, you don't have to do it. You, know, it's, you can just put in the name of the plugin there instead of file, and it'll work. Just All right, last one. I think this was great. It overwhelmed me a lot. I'm kind of at that point where I made a plugin. I saw this and I realized this is a lot to try to just switch to better coding standards for a plugin. Yeah. So this is actually a question for everyone. <laughs> what? Is anyone available for hire? <laughs> <laughs> no, I am actually serious though. I have a WordPress plugin that I'd like to update to more coding standards and change things over to custom post types. So if you're interested in a little bit of freelance work on WordPress coding, I don't have a big budget, but if you're interested, please let me know. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well. Thanks, guys. I believe the uh, reception is at five, right? And it's across the walkway. Well, actually, we're going to have closing remarks in about five minutes over in the main area. So, we're all through. <laughs>